Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus Tecum, benedicta tui mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or tu nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hormutis nostre. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast of a Requiem Mass for the repose of the soul on the day of his burial of His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Today is, in effect, and ought to be observed as a day of national mourning. I do not intend here to give a biographical account and history of the life of His Royal Highness, much of which has been uh, made available uh, and repeatedly uh, on the television and in social media and other places. Suffice to say that all there is to know about Prince Philip is already known. All I will say is that in the past week, much information of a personal nature has come to light. That is, information behind the public image or knowledge or events that otherwise we were all so familiar with regarding His Royal Highness. Instead, personal testimonies and anecdotes uh, have come to surface and come to light, which in many ways serve to counter the otherwise uh, negative portrayals or appreciations of the Prince, who of course was not known for suffering fools gladly, who had a very dry, sometimes coarse wit, which sometimes in public caused a little controversy. But it transpires that in family life and indeed in personal interactions with others, he was quite the opposite of insensitive, but in fact incredibly sensitive and caring. A particular favourite of mine was an anecdote shared by Lord Norman Tebbit, who with his wife and other members of the then government uh, survived a terrorist bomb attack actually here uh, in Brighton and was invited with his wife to a state banquet at Buckingham Palace and seemingly his wife Margaret had difficulties using cutlery since the bomb blast and was a little perturbed as to how she was going to manage a state banquet. Her anxiety was increased somewhat when she discovered as they went into dinner that she had been placed next to the Prince Philip. The first course was brought by the footmen and placed in front of the guests and the prince who was seated next to Margaret picked up his cutlery and motioned to the footman and the footman took the cutlery away and then he proceeded to eat the first course with his fingers causing of course not a little relief to Lady Margaret Tebbit, who followed suit as, of course, uh, one does in those situations. And there are numerous other anecdotes, as I say, that have come to the surface that show and demonstrate that the Prince had many 
good qualities about himself, chief of which perhaps was actually humility. Some of you perhaps have watched The Crown, a series on Netflix. Aside from the very good uh, presentation and attention to detail, uh, re-costumes and uh, locations, etc. Sad to say that some of the content, the actual content, is more based on hearsay than on necessarily accurate historical recounting. But certainly what comes across in the first two series, which are the early days of Queen Elizabeth's reign, what clearly comes across is the great challenge and difficulty that Prince Philip faced before and during his marriage. He gave up what was a very successful and promising career in the Royal Navy. In fact, the first Sea Lord at the time recognised that if Prince Philip had been able to continue, he would easily have become a first sea lord himself. But he forsook his career for the sake of his marriage and of his queen. We all of us are used to the great appreciation and fondness that everyone has for Her Majesty, particularly in appreciation of her dedication and her commitment, her loyalty and her sense of duty and obligation is second to none. We know that she took to heart very seriously her coronation oaths. And we know too that her Christian faith is very dear to her. Indeed, she is not ashamed, nor does she shy away from her annual Christmas messages, from witnessing to her faith. Indeed, reminding us of the reason for the season, we might say somewhat more than necessarily others, and particularly ecclesial hierarchs, do. But surely, part of that continency in honour and duty and fidelity to her oaths is in no small part due, as she said herself, to the great support that she had from the Prince. Seventy-three years of marriage is nothing to be sniffed at, and it is indeed a great pity that the example of Her Majesty and His Royal Highness's marriage has not inspired others to similar levels of fidelity and constancy in their own marriages. Perhaps that might change with now a greater appreciation for a level of support and dedication that the Prince gave the Queen. Humility is evident in both Her Majesty and the Prince Philip. Both serving a higher cause than themselves. 
Her Majesty serving God in respect of her oaths and His Royal Highness serving dutifully his wife as much as his queen. Would that such virtue might become itself adopted by others, particularly in high office in our society today. How much more might we then have confidence in those who would govern us? However, we too also ourselves owe fidelity and loyalty and commitment and dedication in service to one higher than ourselves. Indeed, to the same that Her Majesty so deeply and respectfully abases herself before, namely God. Many of us indeed could take a leaf from the Book of Life of Prince Philip and Her Majesty With regard to our own sense of duty and obligation to him whom we are called and have been made holy and set apart to serve with our lives. Perhaps today many of us will think about our own practice of this great virtue, which goes hand in hand with the theological virtues of faith, hope and charity. Humility, which is the antithesis of vanity, is widely upheld as being the cardinal virtue necessary to manifest faith, hope, and above all, charity. Humility is necessary to serve God and indeed to serve others. There is no question that Prince Philip manifested this virtue of humility amply demonstrated in the thousands of public and royal duties he performed in his lifetime. We, most of us, are not called to have to perform to that level Yet, many of us struggle to serve simply those around us. Perhaps in asking God's mercy for the repose of His Royal Highness's soul today, we might seek God's grace too for ourselves. To inculcate within us and grow within us and develop within us a high sense of moral duty with regard to the fulfillment of our own baptismal promises. This Mass, of course, we offer for the repose of His Royal Highness, but of your charity too. Remember to pray for the living. Remember to pray for Her Majesty the Queen, who no doubt 
is feeling the loss of her great support. Pray too for the other members of the royal family who have lost a father, have lost an uncle, have lost a grandfather and great-grandfather. And let us pray for our nation too at this time. Let us pray that the great strengths and positives of His Royal Highness's life might indeed serve to inspire and encourage others to greater effort and dedication to service of one another. And let us pray too with thanksgiving for the life and service of the Prince Philip. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord, and may light perpetual shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. God save Elizabeth, our Queen and graciously hear us when we call upon thee. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for thy servant Elizabeth, our Queen, upon whom thy mercy has laid the government of this kingdom. May she be given still greater measure of every virtue. Thus worthily adorned, may she turn aside from all wickedness. And with the royal family, may she come at last in grace to thee, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Um,